the wind is always blowing from the west on Fanø, a small island in the middle of the Weyden Sea in Denmark. You can be sure of that. It is one of those certainties that we rely on to keep life on a straight line and calibrate our inner compass. Life's navigation is on autopilot and we ride the waves knowing that we will always find land and arrive at our final destination. On a stormy January day, I took the ferry over to Fainu to go hunt woodcock with Jesper. The strong wind was due west, the water's murky and the woodcocks elusive. Naval Captain Jesper Haurom is an experienced and well-traveled gentleman with a keen eye for seeking the moment and living life. This is a story about choices, our connection to nature and what essentially matters the most. It's all uh, pine trees and uh, heather. Yeah. yeah. So the meat must get some flavor from that, I could imagine. For sure it does, yeah. yes. Just like the beer. Yeah. Like yeah. the beer or the honey or whatever. This yeah. is very known for the yeah. specific yes. for honey yeah. production. I brought you a couple of gifts from Italy. Oh, some olive oil, really good olive oil. I One of my favorites. Of that stuff. Yes. And then a little. Uh, yeah, I so it's a truffle uh, yeah. salsa. It's surprisingly, surprisingly big to me. Yeah. How, how much of a percentage of the island does that cover? It's a third. A third. So, so today we are on uh, Fanø, small island on the west coast of Denmark. We do have uh, woodcocks over here sometimes, especially in November, December, when the migration is going east-west. The migration is coming from where? From Sweden, Norway, Finland. Okay. Over okay. here, yeah. When okay. we have the big migrations, what we call woodcock falls, and they they can be anywhere. Yeah. yeah. We're having a little bit of a, a wind today and uh, I think a little more, even a little more tomorrow. Yeah, so. uh, if we have bad weather like we get later on today and they have to fly against the wind to UK, Scotland, Ireland, mm -hmm. they stay Stop over here, here yeah. take a rest. But as we can see here, it's uh, pine trees, it's quite dense. We shoot, shoot when we get the chance, okay. but keep an eye on each sure, other. Sure. Sure. There's an old story about one of the state owners. Somebody asked him, you know, how how did you manage to get that old? And he said, simply, when we do have shoots and they shout woodcock, I lay on my belly. As we walk and talk, I realize that I actually just met Jesper. I guess hunters worldwide have some sort of instant connection fed by our love for nature and an ancestral understanding of the schematics of the same. Oh, that's another hair, how I did. Did your father hunt? I would say no. He had a shotgun. That was like my dad. That's <laughs> the Jesus. same thing. But then I was lucky that we had a maid in the house to do the house cleaning and stuff. Her husband, all his off time he spent fishing and hunting. And I went with him. And I remember us being sailing for a couple of hours and him seeing a Heinspur. It took like hours. Huh? We didn't see them very often. So for him, that was like finding Super a piece of gold. Huh? Yeah. So I thought, that must be amazing, you know. <laughs> yeah, that dedication. That feeling and dedication, yeah. yeah. A 12, 14 year old boy who was not fishing with gill nets or eel traps and shooting ducks, he was considered being a little bit strange. Yeah. 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 Urbanization and people moving into the cities, they don't have touch and a feel with it. They don't have the understanding of that very complex balance that yeah. we integrate ourselves into as, as human beings. Yeah. The understanding you get when you do hunt or fish, I think it's much more narrow or bounded to nature. I mean, we spend more time 
looking down into the grass and the heather, yeah. than we spent shooting for sure. Yeah. And that's also the hunt. Now we are here, we missed the coffee, mm. bad planning. Mm. But that's so important with the hunting is that we, uh, our social, the social part of it. Uh, but can't you just go out there and drink coffee then? Yeah. Do, do you need to bring guns? Well, that's just kind of the glue yeah. between us. Uh. Okay, that's enough talking about life and hunting. It is time to find those woodcocks. to understand where the dog is going because he's like circling around and around because the wind is getting kicked up and kind of spinning also in here. Two woodcocks we missed. No shoot chance though. Seems like there's something in the air. Yeah. Is that possible? No. No feathers, no nothing. Um, the recent shoulder surgery is clearly affecting my otherwise excellent shooting skills. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I shot behind it. This is not the time for a regret. That was a nice situation. Huh? Yeah, it was really yeah. nice. Might be a hair. I wouldn't expect woodcocks out here, but you never know. Okay. Ellie, Ellie, Ellie. We didn't see it run off, but it looks like the bed. Yeah. Right here. I think we should spend time on the rabbits. Jesper practices a quite rare form of hunting where team ferrets are sent into the rabbit's burrows, hopefully resulting in a furry cannonball shooting out of one of the exit holes. I saw what they say there. Yeah. I ate my bag yesterday. Aye. Maybe we're saving for Denmark or something. Or? Ah. Okay. Tokens of a rich hunting life fills Jesper's beautiful home with memories. Where did you harvest them? Finland. Huh? Now here's a familiar face, a white tail, but this one from Finland. Two pins go in behind the front teeth and they ring, then they can't open the mouth. Okay. Because if they go down without it, they kill the rabbit yeah. and then they eat and sleep. Yeah. And okay. we wait. The style is brass, nose ring doesn't hurt the ferret at all. Though I would expect our furry friend here to find it killing restrictive, so to speak.
Nej. What's the plan? What are we doing? So we have the thoughts? golf yard. We'll go in and check out rabbit holes. Hope the dog will point out some for us. Okay. If he point and tell us that there's somebody hope. Yeah. yeah. We release the ferret into the we hole do. and okay. set up. No one's home. The population has clearly declined a lot. Is there a lot of the boroughs that doesn't have rabbits? Yeah. The rabbits are actually getting sick, right? Yeah, they have this muscomatosis, so they get infections in the eyes and they die. And then they've got another one like the bird flu. Okay. So we have lost 80-90% of the rabbits. <laughs> Did he react to any of the holes? Not or? really. No. Well, if he starts to stick the head in... Try and dig a little yeah, bit. Now. Then, uh, yeah, then if he starts to dig out or to bite in the grass, yeah. It's super. Yeah. Let's try this one to yeah. see. You have a couple of holes here in front of you, three of them. Uh -huh. One here, one here. So I'll stand here and shout, shout, you know. Left, behind right. You, yeah. Or something if it's <laughs> anything. How long time are they normally in the holes, Jesper? As long as it takes. I mean, it can take two minutes to flush the first rabbit, and it can be half an hour. Okay. okay. So it's a patient game. He's down in front here. Okay. Danny, is he going back? Oh, there he is. As we walk from hole to hole, we talk about life and take in the beautiful winter landscape. Go back, grab a cup of coffee. Yeah, yeah we can do that. Steen, Jesper's long-haired pointer, is pointing. A group of seven to eight partridges. <laughs> But they're out of season. We didn't get any rabbits, but that was a good, kind of like a perfect end to a, a good walk on the golf yeah. course. <laughs> the day after, I meet with Steen, a good friend of Jesper's, for another try for woodcock or rabbits. Okay. So, plan now, now, if we go help. Okay. Uh, Kleiner Münsterländer breed. This dog type typically stays relatively close to um, to the hunters. We'll walk for a couple of hours. It's primarily forest that we're going to be going in, so we're not going to have these long shots. Steen is also going to have his gun ready, so when I uh, miss with the first two shots, he's going to pick it up for me. <laughs> so, go. <laughs> Hvad er det? Det er nok noget kanin, gammel kaninbær. Det ja. ligner det. Okay. Men det er vel sjældent, han får dem ud. De er vel i, ja, i bolle, det, gør, ja, det er det, det er som er jo. Ja. Ja.
We are combing through one area after the other, but hear and see no birds. There is nothing here. Stain is sure that the wind has actually forced the remaining birds on the island to seek shelter on the opposite side, on the eastern side. <laughs> Having a few of those during the hunt is considered medicine for the soul. We gave up on the woodcocks, grabbed Jesper's ferret, and then off to the golf course for another try. It didn't take long for Steen's dog to show interest in a rabbit hole, so we brought out Mr. Ferret from his cozy box. We try another hole on the other side for good measure. It's clearly still a problem with my shoulder and I'm far behind on both shots again. It is a beautiful and exciting hunt. It's very different than anything that I ever tried before. Something special and almost spiritual happens when two different species, or in this case three, work together in unity to hunt and to feed. Theme for saying Delugas. Just beautiful. Two rabbits, two shots. Well, forget about the other shots, we don't count those, but this is all we need. That's all. Det er typisk størrelse for dem. Ja, det er det. Ja. Ja. Uh, de er jo pæn, pæn kaniner. Ja. Det er pænt størrelse, ikke også? Ja. I was just asking Steen and um, just a little bit about the rabbits, and he said this, this is the typical size event. They only have about 90, uh, 10% left. 90% of their population actually has been dying off over the last... Last five years. Five years. Yeah. Uh, because of sickness. And that happens, of course, when the population is too high. Um, we get these outbreaks of some certain kinds of, of viruses. This uh, virus goes to the eyes and they go blind. They can't feed themselves and they will slowly starve to death or they will wander off and get eaten by uh, predators. If we don't harvest them, they will eventually be struck by sickness and then the population will die off. If we keep the population low at a decent level, then we won't get these big outbreaks. Yeah. Not the woodcock that we went we for originally, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, how it is. is yeah, yeah. The wind is in west and I know where I am. What do you write to a man that you don't know who just opened up his home and world to you just because you asked? I've been living outside of Denmark, my so-called home country, for over half of my life. For the first time here in this hunting cabin, I feel nostalgic about it, and I miss Denmark, and I miss Danes like Jesper. <laughs> Ja, det er rigtig fint. 
Det er ingen snapper. Nej. Det er ikke der, hvor vi var i går. Nej. Nå, vi tænker om ordentligt. Fart. Thanks. Thank you. So we'll travel stuff, and then the book. Yes. Maybe we do it again. Please. Yes. Let's do that. Until next Thanks, time. Everyone. See you. Ciao. Come here. I spent a lot of time at the wait and see on the west coast of Denmark. It was one of my hunting grounds when I first started out hunting. Sometimes you have to go away to once again feel at home. Sometimes you have to spend a day with a stranger like Jesper to ask yourself, who am I? Is this me or someone else? Where am I and what do I actually want? I'm quite a shy person, and normally I get uncomfortable when I have any eyes on me. Today, I will have thousands. It's no small feat to outsmart the instincts of a hundred geese rolling in from the high skies. <music> Stephanie and her dad, Dennis, have it down to a science. They have perfected the art of goose hunting and are the authorities in Denmark when there are geese to be regulated. I joined them for a few days where I got to admire their hunting skills and enjoy Stephanie's so-called single mom goose lasagna. Though most of all, I got to know the family and the glue that holds them together. This is a human story. First time I'm meeting her, but I'm excited. She's, she's super cool and uh, very energetic. So, <laughs> super good. Good morning. Hi. 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 Good morning. I have then, coffee. How far? How far is it? You said about an hour. To an the hour, yeah. Yeah. It's probably quite wet and soggy and yeah, yeah, not ideal. And then it's uh, winter wheat. Okay. So it's it's grass like this. Okay. But um, yeah, and they're they're you know. That's why they, they hate the barnacles. Yeah. He wants the wheat to stay there. The most important thing for the farmer is just to shoot them away from the area. Okay. So we hope they will come in and we scare them off mm -hmm. and hopefully mm -hmm. shoot some. Hunting is hunting, so we'll see how it yeah. goes today. Because yeah, it's yeah. a new area. Yeah, We've yeah, never been there, that. and that's yeah. always a little... Uh... Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's a massive operation, and all hands are on deck except mine. I have no idea what to do or how to help, and there's no time to explain this amateur anything at this point. I always look for... For a goose Yeah. Like this, a big banana. In the middle, sides. there's a lot of decoys. Okay. And then you go th uh, thinner and thinner. Okay. And you want them to land right in the middle. standing like this, uh -huh. it looks like a flock of geese that are on About the way. Yeah. Yeah. Now I've done my share of duck hunting over decoys, but what the hell is a windsock? 
And you lay here and you lay as far in with the gun as possible. Okay. Push this down. Got it. When we say now, go up. Okay? Yeah. It didn't take long before the first flock started circling around us, clearly curious about the decoys. Once and again, they come in from afar, circle around, and then fly off, way before ever getting within shooting distance. These geese are coming in from about a mile away. Over there. You can see that's the, the hot spot over there, for sure. And the geese that came in and looked at the formation, they only came in here because they heard the calls and they saw the geese. So they were like, oh, what's going on there? Let's see. And then they come over and we heard, you can hear and you can see it on them. They're not afraid. They just don't want this field. How, how can you hear and, and see that difference? Uh, you can see. You mentioned that about the calls, right? Normally, if they would want to go down here, you, you, they would go down, they would go around and around a couple of times. And, and some then of, they all come in. Yeah. To land. You can see the, the geese again. Here we have it again. Oh, uh, that flock there. Uh, a like big flock again, flying towards the hot spot over there. The thing about this hunt is the, that the farmer didn't scout. If he scouted, we would have known that the hotspot were over there. And we would have laid there. So this is a difficult hunt for us. This is not the hot spot today. I thought it was because th that's what he mentioned. And we had a couple of small flocks, but they were not interested in this field. They didn't show interest at all. First hunt this season with a zero. Hmm. And we didn't even fire one single shot. Dennis is pissed. Bad intel. As we are packing up after a few hours, we start seeing flocks of geese flying in different directions, and some even appear to want to cross our path. Dennis makes a quick decision, and we rush to set up again in a different spot. First geese are coming in even before we slide into our ditch for cover. <laughs> now they want to come down. Gabriel Stephanie's son gets busy collecting the harvest. flight of the geese ends as quickly as it had begun. Yeah. 
It's time to head back home and get some lunch. Now the other comes so perfectly. Oh. <laughs> Beautiful animal, huh? Yeah, beautiful. Shot uh, at your place? Yeah. At my dad's yeah. place. Yeah. Not very well behaved, I thought. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> one moment protest a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> the beautiful taxidermy decorating the walls tells a diverse hunting story. Self-caught and smoked salmon is a perfect brunch dish and, of course, with some excellent Danish bread, some cold French white wine, I'm digging this family. Thanks for a good morning, hon. Thanks for well, a good morning, hon. Cheers. It turned out pretty good, yeah, really after good. all, right? Yeah, the, in the end, it, it turned out much better than it looked. Are these all the calls that uh, you guys used to then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you have a bunch of videos on it? Yeah, they used yeah. to. Produced many videos, actually. This is the barnacle, uh, barnacle buster, actually. Uh, this is the call we used it today for the barnacle geese. One of the most uh, cool thing about this hunt is when you can communicate with the animal, yeah. talk to them, okay. have a conversation with them. That's cool. We can't ask the goose what it can see, but their their eye is more uh, developed than the human being eye. Decoys, especially, can reflect UV light. And what's that? Totally white cloth. This is what's the cloth. Wow. If you take white feathers from a bird, this is the reflection. If you take phosphor or artificial whitening, this is what happens. We have to test them and it's important we, that we do. Yeah. You want the geese to land in here? Stephanie and her dad not only hunt for food, but they have actually fulfilled a dream of making hunting their way of living, selling gear specifically for goose and bow hunting, their two main passions. We want the goose hunting to continue here in Denmark. Yeah. And if we, people hunt them the wrong way, they shoot them too far because yeah. I don't know, you can't get thing. them in. Mm -hmm. Someday well, they will just say, close. Yeah. Yeah. And then they will gas them and burn them, mm -hmm. like they do in Holland. They have too many in too many near the airport. They airports. close the hunt and they then they have them, too they many. They shoot out a net and then net. capture them that way and then gas them. Gas, gas them, them and burn them. them. Gas them and Over don't one use million them for birds. anything. More than one million each year. Yeah. Wow. wow. But the barnacle population increases each year with 10%, even though we shoot a lot of them now. Mm -hmm. It's 300 grams a day each bird. Okay. Times 5,000 for right. one week. Right. We're talking about more than a million crowns or 150,000 euros. euros. Yeah. What is a human role in the ecosystem? Big question. Now more on that later. For now, my human role is to eat and drink a little bit more. This will probably be a little late. The next morning we start out with a traditional Danish breakfast with bread and, well, Danish, uh, Danish, Danish uh, you know those. This is from the, the geese. Ground that this morning. You can actually smell, you can the, smell the goose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I shot a robot. That was... Just like, you know, inspired by uh, Dancing with Wolves. Uh -huh. I opened it up, took out the liver. <laughs> I took the first bite. <laughs> All around me took a bite as well. And we had it, have it on film. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's pretty hardcore. The filling breakfast was surely needed, for now starts the hard work. Yeah, he... Bye. 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 A lot of work. <laughs> a lot of work. Oh, yeah. shit. For example, take one of these guys here. I see this one. Oh, this is a, this is a grown one, a big one. Yeah. You can take it like this, hold like this. Mm -hmm. Take a good grab here and just pull it down like this. Yeah. Okay. See that? Okay. Yeah. That. That's pretty just easy. Pretty easy. And like this. And then you take a knife. Slide it down there. Slide it down there. And like this. And like that. Okay? And of course the feathers you will have to move afterwards. Sure. sure. Let me take off the main two meat beefs here. Up here. So 
that we get, you know, we get 90% of the meat off like this, and the rest goes for the predators. Uh -huh. Uh, carcasses I lay out here in the field. One of the things that's uh, been talked about a lot in the U.S. is carcasses being left out in the wild with pieces of lead ammunition left in it. The birds of prey, they come in and they eat it, yeah. and even the smallest pieces of lead goes into their system, yeah. and it eventually kills them. Uh, lead is not legal in Denmark anymore, yeah. so we can't use lead anymore. No. No. Actually, after I, used, uh, I started using uh, steel shots, I realized actually it's they're very efficient, but they have to be fast. Goose hunting, yeah. we have them close, yeah. 20 meters, so yeah. smack them down with yeah. the steel. My brother and I grew up in, in Delaware, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and uh, we know the methods from there. Brought yeah. it over to Denmark. Nobody hunted geese that way with yeah. layout blinds yeah. in the field, in the middle of the field where the geese want to come down. After we put a little dent in the butchering of the last couple of days' harvest, we take a walk about in the surrounding forest looking at nature's artwork, as well as the most enhanced saltstone stick I have ever seen. Art, you just can't wrap your hands around it. 60, 65, 66, we moved from the States to Denmark. Okay, so how, father, how old were you at that time? I was six years old. And then we, I stayed here for 20 years before. Mm -hmm. I miss that. I want to show it to my wife and my three children. I want to show them beautiful uh, East Coast, you know, a little yeah. up and down there. But then we wanted to fly from New York to uh -huh. some place out of the West. I wanted to show them the, the most famous national parks out mm -hmm. there, Yellowstone and mm -hmm. Yosemite maybe. Actually, we saw 40 states we drove through. We drove uh, 14,000 kilometers in five weeks. <laughs> Typically, they hide in here. See if they we can see them. They probably walk around when we walk here. There's a live, uh, a live freezer, a live fridge, a live cooler, if you will. This I, I got from my area here. Uh -huh. Uh, except, of course, the rest tank up there. That was a little too big for my wife in there. <laughs> so I didn't want that in the sitting room. Thank you. That's a good run, this one as well. You want to taste this, Daphne? Yeah. <clears throat> I wouldn't try that today. That's no, sure. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Good Danish gesture is always bringing candy. Candy! Goose meat. Uh -huh. Handmade knife. Families used to gather for the mutual task of making dinner. I'm very happy to see that in some families that still exists. This. Most kids do not like game meat, and most kids do not like these broccoli for sure. Yeah. fat do you use? I use oil. the oil and butter. And butter. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Onions in and then the, um, the meat. The goose meat. The goose meat and then I put salt in. I'm gonna put the uh, yeah, spices in. This on? your veggies. This is called the 
mayonnaise sauce, some kind of cheese, cheese sauce. While Stephanie is cooking up her single mom gourmet, Dennis is very generous with the wine. Yum. Mm -hmm. So now I'll put this in the oven, and after a little while, I'll put cheese on top. Five minutes on each side. I think that's going to do the trick. <laughs> Is it warm enough, Steph? Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Now I don't know if I want to live with my parents, but this closeness with the ones you love the most is surely heartwarming and inspirational. That keeps the back wheel spinning like the loose wheel in his mind. Always seen the little bit behind and he can't afford the good wheel no more. It used to help him pass the time. Long days, long lives, but the carny way. As we reach the final judgment, life is good, this feels right, and these geese ends the final moments in cheese. Not too bad. And in case you wonder, the long-haired woman at the table is our dedicated cameraman, Aiden. This is really good. Is it good? Yeah, it's really good. I like how you sounded surprised when you took the first bite. It's good. <laughs> it's good, guys. It's actually good. <laughs> Talent and creativity runs wild and deep when we are allowed to connect to the source, to nature. And of course, there's always Tommy Hilfinger getting in the mix. This is a story about choices, about time, and about the future and our human role in the grand equation of it all. This is about that what gives a person a sense of purpose, a reason for living. The mysteries of these woods set the scene for dramatic plays every day. In here, we Danes have hunted our food for thousands of years. Now what does the woods, rock and roll music, hunting, world travel, and cooking have in common? This guy, Mr. Nikolai Jewell. Good to see you. Glamorous. Uh, nice. That's the hunting, uh, hunting house, hunting yeah. cabin. Yeah. So uh, there's a uh, fellow, fellow deer in the area. Okay. And uh, where we're going to be today, there's uh, a doe shot yesterday. Well, I'm bummed that I can't hunt today because of that. Yeah. On my bad shoulder, but uh, all the pressure is on you now. So. Well, if something comes <laughs> by, I'll uh, put it down for sure. <laughs> Nikolai is a professional chef and rock star. His entire life story is one of passion, and bow hunting has recently become his latest. I'll, I'll go up there.
Now what the hell is going on in this forest? There was clearly something in there that was thrashing yeah. on me. That's yeah. about a fellow mark. Up this spot over here. Well, I've had a big fellow buck. I think if we go down there and make noise and we just set up and we'll push them out. Up. Well, we, we'll be quiet. Ah, okay. <laughs> but then put the hang up and then um, and then we can just sit there and there's a couple of uh, high seats. Despite the machine noise, this forest is still magical and has signs of deer all over. As we sneak around looking for deer, the sound of the machines increase and it's very clear at this point that we are not going to see any deer at all. So we, we have a problem with invasive species in Denmark and uh, we have the, the coon dog. The raccoon dog is a big, big problem. Then we have these guys up here, the working men in the forests. Um, so unfortunately they're pushing everything around. So I don't know where to go, but hopefully Nikolai has a plan for a second option. Judging from the sound of it, other hunters are having a lot more luck today. That was uh, the start of my London life and uh, went to um, LA and uh, recorded an album with um, Chili Peppers producer. And then tour with the Food Fighters and Radiohead and mm. all the kind of smashing pumpkins. Nikolai is so damn chill that I sometimes actually think he's about to fall asleep. This camo guy is the most zen rock and roll star that I have ever met. I'm gonna put up uh, the tree stuff. I've had a uh, big fellow buck. I had the camera down here. Uh, and had a big fellow buck on the camera. Granted, he's also the only rock and roll star that I've ever met, but nonetheless, Nico is a very well equipped guy. Surely he will not go down on gear. Since I can't hunt due to recent shoulder surgery, I'm on duty calls, so to speak. I place myself about 100 meters downwind from Nikolai and fire off the first grunt.
between the war going on next to us, the joggers, the dogs barking and the machines roaring, it is clear that we are wasting our time here and it's so fucking annoying that the tranquility of the experience is gone. No, it's interesting. Uh, I thought about it earlier now, this, these two ladies coming here, smiling and happy and yeah. clearly like curious and admiring. And so. Two people walking by in Italy, you could be pretty sure they won't smile at you. In a hunting situation. Say hi, in a hunting situation, yeah. And there's specifically one type of hunt, a driven hunt after the wild boar, had brought a lot of attention because there's been people shot dead every day, it happens every single year. People. Yeah, people. Okay. Yeah. Denmark and Scandinavia have really old hunting traditions like most of Europe. What sets these countries apart is a very high approval rate and acceptance of hunting from the general non-hunting public. As we drive through Copenhagen, I see my old city with new eyes. Tivoli is in the very, very center of Copenhagen. It's definitely a super cool place and some of the best restaurants in, in Copenhagen are also in there. I think it might have been the, the world's oldest amusement park, Tivoli Park. We are meeting Nikolai Tohelene, a kind of modern bazaar with all kinds of culinary shops. I would love to get a coffee because I'm extremely sleepy, so if I'm going to say anything intelligent, I think coffee is needed. Yeah. <laughs> For small things, I do I buy from here, and you've got like all the chefs in the whole of Copenhagen, they go there to buy every morning. And it's just amazing that they don't do that like soft class because that's that's pretty much the most important thing for chefs. Like meat, you can you can get in good quality in England. These markets are always my favorite spot in any city. We actually have some game birds here also. There's some pigeons. Pigeons? And what's that? Teal. Teal? Yeah. Teal duck. If there's one thing that chefs and hunters have in common, it's an obsessive fetish for knives. Eight-inch chef's knife. This is the one that you primarily use? Or? Yeah, that's my number one. I've got 11 of these lives. I mean, what one could argue that you might want to donate some <laughs> some of your friends, new friends. Uh, well, we... we're gonna look at what what looks nice. Okay. On a purple tail, yeah, looks really. Really beautiful. Yeah. So, um, get a little bit of that. I do uh, most of my shopping here. Is this your, your favorite of all? Or? Yeah. That quality yeah. and assortment? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I use a bit of this for the tatar. What are these? That's uh, the late season's uh, rolls, and these are called uh, Trakkantala. And the flavor profiles are different in, in which way? Yeah, these are a little bit more apricot in the flavor. Huh? Oh, this? Super salty, so yeah. no, no salt added, no, no salt needed. No, no, no. <laughs> but it's uh, great with uh, fish. Give me a rundown of your culinary kind of introduction and where did that start? And well, it started, in, um, it started at home. 
my parents say uh, big time foodies. So I had sort of uh, delicious food exposed to me at a very early age. And then um, in London, I started cooking. But you don't just jump in and say, hey, I'm a chef now and hire me. No, I played guitar. So <laughs> <laughs> I started, I'm a rock star. I'm a rock star. <laughs> and then like, okay. Nikolai's story is fascinating and inspiring to me. Makes me wish that I was 20 years old again so I could take another new ride like his. <laughs> Flashes of distant suppressed memories from my years of studying in Copenhagen are suddenly coming back. You use six months of your life waiting for a red light. We are going to Copenhagen Zoo, where Nikolai has set up the coolest outdoor kitchen. Here we meet with Stephanie, who is bringing a fallow buck that her dad harvested the day before. To uh, zoo backstage. <laughs> Vi har en hjort med. Nej! Ja. Har du en du selv har skudt? Nej, det er ja. Stephens far, Dennis, der har skudt. The zoo's visitors are curious and fascinated by the deer getting pulled around and wants to know more. Det er fint, at vi får nogle unge ansigter på os. Lige derinde omkring hjørnet, der står der en kok, der inden laver det. Nå, der er en lang tid, der er en lang tid, der skal have stykke af det der. Nå, du vil bare lige smage her. Det er interessant, at det er sådan en polarisation, fordi jeg ser de to mennesker, der var der før, de to mennesker, der var der før, og det var som, at de kødte deres ansigter, og det var ikke rigtig, hvad de så. Det var rigtig også foreningsfølgelig, ikke danske. Ja, så jeg tror, det er en forskellig forskellig. This is what I'm fascinated by. Why and how do Danes and Scandinavians in general differ from the rest of Europe when it comes to hunting and understanding of the circle of life? I think one of the main reasons the Danes are as accepting and appreciate hunting is that people like Nikolai openly and proudly speak about their passion for hunting and cooking wild game. We get on the way with the skinning and I'm excited to actually hear from a professional chef how he would butcher and use the different cuts of meat. If you want to determine if the animal is healthy, you need to look at the organs. Mm -hmm. If the animal is uh, ill, you'll see it uh, typically on uh, the liver. So um, what I typically do is I study the liver and uh, the milk mm -hmm. and the kidneys. And if they look fine, then the animal is uh, typically fine. Two guests are stopping by to follow the process and satisfy their curious minds. Have you come to skin day? All this here, it comes out first, so we can come into the cold in baby. So have you come here? Still a whole is clear. He will be near one day as the skin to get come out. So can we come into the cold? We can squeeze baby after. Such an important lesson for a young kid to see and understand the origins of our food. So we take the shoulder off first. Now, do you need my help, or can I just focus no, on you the just wine? You just drink wine. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Oh, I... <laughs> so, then we have uh, the back leg here. You basically just 
follow the bone here. Mm -hmm. When you butcher a leg, you've got like the ball joint here, mm -hmm. and you can kind of see the way the muscles separate, and you can see there's like a line that goes from the knee up to the ball joint. Uh -huh. So the objective here is to basically debone it. Is yeah. That it? Yeah, okay. you debone it, and you can see here this is mm -hmm. the inner thigh. Mm -hmm. This is uh, nice the pistol. Piece. Yeah, the inner thigh we're going to use for cooking. That, that's uh, the accelerating muscle. That's the top of a piece of meat, and that actually that's why it's hard to um, to cook a whole uh, leg joint. So this is uh, the back leg, outer thigh, the rump, inner thigh, back strap, shank, and the shoulder. Of course, the tenderloin inside here. Mm -hmm. And then here, we've actually also got a little separate muscle. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. So that's kind of sort of the nuts and bolts of okay. a deer. Cool. So what are we doing? Walk we're gonna, me through it. We're going to roast some uh, pumpkin. Okay. Add some garlic, some sage, and a little bit of chili. <laughs> We're going to do uh, herb sauce, anchovies, a little bit of salt. Then we need to chop some herbs. It's called flat leaf parsley, darling. We'll take some basil. Yeah, that's fine. Basil goes in. A little bit of uh, Dijon mustard, some lemon juice, red wine vinegar, and then olive oil. And then you add a little bit of caper. So, now that's ready. Mmm. Does it taste like s***? <laughs> <laughs> no, it tastes really good. It tastes really good. But what surprised me, and I, th I think my face kind of uh, revealed that, was that the flavors are all strangely separated. Yeah. That was my surprise. So now right. we're going to grill some meat. We're going to do a reverse marinade. Okay. It's a really good technique where you actually marinate uh, the meat when it's grilled so the resting juices from the meat mm. will pick up the flavors. You never guess the places that I've been. This is uh, yeah, the backstrap. Okay. We're basically going to marinate it with uh, salt and pepper, lemon juice, and uh, olive oil. Dream I live in. Never gonna let the day begin. Never gonna let the day begin. Yeah, it's, really it's not bad for a bonfire, man. Fantastic. Only in that dream that I live in. Oh, don't wake me up before you go. And I'll just make this bed my own. Oh, darling, please just let me sleep. Give me my dream. Thank you for the cooking, Nikolai, and you guys, thank you for bringing, yeah. bringing in the meat. But I guess if there ever was a reason for the why we hunt, this will be it. Yeah. With that, bon appetit. Bon appetit. When you think about Venice, Italy, you think about this fantastic city that is literally built in the water with thousands of tourists with carnivals and gondolas. Now that is truly Venice, but it's also a city that's built in the middle of a very delicate aquatic ecosystem. The Venetian Lagoon is struggling. 
humans have altered the fragile balance of these shallow waters. Today we join hunter, farmer and conservationist Michele. <laughs> who like many other local hunters, have been fundamental in the push for restoring the balance to the lagoon's ecosystem. The dark stay in private land, the private land danno molto a lot of feed. The good day for duck hunting at the moment is uh, a lot of rainy, windy, or northeast bo Bora. <laughs> Salute. <laughs> Grazie. Ooh. Ooh. Grazie. Buon appetito. Altrettanto a voi. It is uh, the um, important project for uh, restoring, uh, restoring and uh, life uh, lagoon, lagoon refresh uh, water on the river mm -hmm. put in the Venetian lagoon. So uh, with the fresh water coming into the lagoon, uh, exactly the and amount of salt grow, in the lagoon itself will of the, course drop because and grow the, um, water. a lot uh, of uh, new vegetation. Within this time period of the last 25 years, it's changed dramatically. A lot of the tourists have come in. A lot of the big boats have come in. They have dug out channels for the boats to actually come into Venice and that have disturbed the ecosystem. As hunters of a, of a different generation, we need to figure out where that balance lies. Taking a part in the ecosystem, understanding what your role is, and taking responsibility of maintaining this ecosystem. With those wise words for me, we head off to fulfill one of my dreams, meeting the duck decoy maker that not only made Hemingway's decoys, but actually spent time with Ernest hunting in the lagoon. This is the decoy by Liano, the song of uh, original artisan decoy. Papa and Mama. Liano is the son of the famous decoy maker Nane Cristo and he recalls the days with his father in Hemingway with joy and a hefty dose of nostalgia. Today, plastic has polluted and killed off the artisanal craft of decoy making. American, uh, American book on decoy making. Liano still fires off the workshop every now and then to honor the dying craft and his family heritage. Ah, okay, so this is a fresh cork. Sugar natural. Okay. Two layers of cork are cut and combined into one floating lifelike decoy. producing it, the materials with the texture on the top of the decors and in combination with the, uh, with the paint that they're actually using, it gives it a harmony, so it looks real. With some expected wild dust cooking coming up, I of course gladly accept these fresh garden tomatoes offered by Liano's sister, God, I love Italy. Ciao. <laughs> Ciao. The mental paradox of actually hunting in Venice becomes pressingly apparent as the rubber boots pull up and I see the boats.
years I've missed these cold salt water splashes on my face. After a little outboard help, we are off to our final destination, hoping to be the first to arrive and get the prime spot. Michaela is hopeful. There are many different kinds of hunters, as there are many different kinds of people. By the looks of Michaela's home cure game meats and the sweet sound of an AIDS cork releasing a good bottle of red wine, I'm amongst my kind of people. The good ones. The ones with the lust for life. It is time to check in at the hotel and get some sleep before the alarm will soon break the calming clocking sounds of the water. The three star accommodation. Three, three, three stars. Three, 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 four stars. Three, four stars. Good morning. Well, the morning can only get better than the night. Uh, these boats are surely not built for double occupancy and not for a constantly farting, moving and snoring cameraman. With the lights of Venice as a backdrop, the last decoys go in the water. Damn, I'm rusty. Right f behind us. Dogs are paddling around behind us, but we cannot shoot there. It is protected land. When a seal finally swings by, I am sleeping. Only teal yeah. this morning. <laughs> what the f man? I'm not. I'm behind it. Then this. As always when packing up, dogs suddenly arrive out of the blue, and then I miss. Decoys in, and back we go for some food and a nap. Oh my 
Refueled and refreshed, we ride the waves again, and I'm feeling strangely optimistic. Formation is complete and ample amounts of paint are being applied. As we settle in and set up, the lack of sleep induces the well-known hunter silliness, and I'm again 100% ape. <laughs> What the f Yeah, don't worry about that one. As the light dims and Michaela huffs and puffs the best that he knows how, we see more and more ducks around us. See it? What an evening and what a scenery. I can see why Hemingway fell in love with this kind of hunting and especially here. Today the decoys are only for glamour. We are off to an old abandoned fisherman's house on a little island in the middle of the lagoon. Here local hunters, fishermen and the occasional outsider meet to eat, drink and be merry. Anybody who wants Hunter, to come. Hunter, uh, fisherman, passionate. The house actually dates back to the 1500s. And today the locals are doing their best to maintain it in a usable state. Tomatoes from Capadilla. I start setting up for the cooking and to get an idea of what I managed to actually forage and steal from the surrounding areas. Tell me about Hemingway because it's one of the reasons why we're here. Hemingway spent a lot of time in the Venetian Lagoon. Ernest loved this type of hunting. Go in the boat and uh, stay in the barrel a lot of uh, okay. morning. Okay, okay. And Sounds like a nice life. Same. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, your experience. So one of the things that Hemingway obviously did and appreciated was drinking, and so do I. Salute. Salute. 
in Venezia Lagoon, the hunting is a strong tradition, but uh, the environment in these 10 years old changed a lot. High marea, mm -hmm. the wind um, and the wave uh, corrodes it uh, or the, the emerged land. Okay. This is a big problem. Uh, for the duck because arrive and don't uh, no place to stay the, the, hide yeah, and no yeah, place to, yes. to eat yeah. so part of the rehabilitation project that they're actually working on now in the lagoon which is super interesting is that they are um, they're trying to get more fresh water into the lagoon to certain areas to increase the rich richness of yes. of the ecosystem yes. here and create more more feed for, for the ducks yes yeah? is that the correct? Fish and the fish, yeah. This is marijuana. It's really, really good for cooking. This is necessary in these kind of productions, especially with these uh, cameramen and assistants, and it's just too f much. <laughs> so we have a female mallard. Today we will uh, use the breasts. This is the gizzard, basically where they have the corn and everything left. It smells amazing. A good dash of Michaela's homemade spice mix. Now we want to get the herbs out before the butter actually gets too brown. Butter gets in, it, in and around it. The smell of the sea mixed with the aromas of the smoke and the browning butter is nothing less than splendid. Really high heat at the beginning, so we'll close up the outside and retains all the, the juices in the inside, and then we have to take them off and let them cook really slow after. The house might have been abandoned many years ago, but it is quite functional for a warm early fall cookout. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, the most important thing is that you let it rest. If you cut it right now, all the juices are just going to run out of it. It's not going to stay in the meat. Normally, if I use the yes, gizzards, yes. I simply just yes. get it off. Don't you get the Prosecco in the glass? Okay. Ah, what do you nice. know? Oh, cook perfect. <laughs> it's all beginner's luck, trust me. Occasionally it happens. It's cooked a little more, this one. Un appetito. Grazie. It's very good with a little bit of the, um, the thyme. A little tweak of that in there. Last time for this round. Cheers, Michele. <laughs> you are active as a conservationist. Also, you help maintain the lagoon. You help with these projects, uh, not only going out here hunting, but you actually give something back to, to the lagoon in that way. Non si può solo pensare a, alla, alla cacciata, a portare a casa mm -hmm. qualcosa. Si va a caccia per essere controllori dell'ambiente, controllori della laguna. Mm -hmm. L'azione di sparare viene dopo. Thank, thank you, you Danny, so thank, thank you, you for sharing your stuff. Beautiful experience. Thank you guys, see you next time. Ciao.
lovely Sweden, my dear wild sister country that we Danes just simply love to hate. Well, we don't actually love to hate Sweden. We just love to hate the Swedes. Luckily, on this trip, we meet just a few. We start our journey in Copenhagen, Denmark, where people are funny, nice, and on the weekends go absolutely batch crazy. We might look all civilized and eco-conscious on our bicycles, but pour a few beers into our bellies, and we are back at our primitive Viking stage, and sh gets fun. Mm, might not be the same with this one. Now what's up with the energy and the perfect smile on this one? All right, this is Meta from Copenhagen. When she's not working her own or clients ass off in the gym, she's out in nature nurturing her own yin and yang. Hi. 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 Um, I have my own car here, so I think we can just drive secretly because when we arrive to uh, to Sweden, it's very nice and we have our own cars for Going to the high seas. We need the room for the boards in the back. Yes, anyway, exactly. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We arrive at a typical Swedish cottage where we'll be spending the next few days while we are out roaming the woods at night. Yeah, you heard right. Night. Hi. 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 Danny. Klaus. Was it a good trip? Yeah, it was a good trip. It was a beautiful landscape. Yeah. We are not in a rush. The sun is going down in 10 minutes. But what we have seen in this area for the last couple of weeks is that the wild boars are coming out about sunset. Okay. Yeah. So I think we should be out in 10 minutes and I will drop you off actually only like 500 meters from here. That exact high seat you are going in, it's a two guys high seat. When you come in, you open the door very slowly and then you will see three windows. We use the heat pad because then you can actually see what you're aiming for. Yeah, yeah. Because it's a thermal device, so of course it attracts the heat. Okay. Okay, you can see it down there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can okay, see it. Let's it lights just... up like a Christmas tree, man. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay, I'm running down. If you can just keep the rifle up. Ha <laughs> It's perfect! Oh. Perfect! Well, so you're gonna say it was That's not even on there. So, is it your first time in the high seat for night hunting? I've been night hunting in Hungary, but that's with lights. So, I will drop you off and I will show you the direction. Then you just stalk in very, very slow and quietly because with the wild boars finally comes to the feeding spot, they will more or less stay there. Okay. So there's no rush if they finally are in there. We shot it in at 60 meters here. Is that about the same yes. range, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, it's okay. going to be the same. When I'm hunting, I'm just such a nerd. Like, I'm getting in the zone of just being so focused. And it's just a new way of exploring the wildlife when you see it in the dark. And it's so awesome. So now we're just going to be totally quiet. Do you have the stick for this one? Yeah, okay. But it okay, this is different. I was quite hesitant before going out because my jelly is really solitude hunting with a bow up close and personal. But this, looking through a night vision monocular, that's damn outright exciting. Just don't. Every little sound is like a bomb going off.
There's movement in the dark. So we have just been sitting for about four and a half hours now in the high sea, but I haven't heard anything at all. So my idea is now that we are going to a new area to do a stalk. And Danny will just be sitting, hopefully, because he had a, um, we could see in the trail camps that yesterday he had a, um, a Kyla. So a Kyla is an old dominant male wild boar. Good luck at the new place. Scopes, They're especially designed for detecting mice. Road. So that means we are too noisy to get into 20 meters of any wild boars. We still hope that Danny is having luck over at his place. I feel like I'm in, like literally in the Blair Witch project. Yes, tech and pitch black darkness is surely not the best combo. Not so sure if I should leave my stand, but this darkness, combined with the devilish mice that roams these sweetest lands, has got me shivery and I need to take faith into my own boots, so to speak. Another one. Am I being chased? There's absolutely no wind. The fog rolled in. So, you're missing a little step, as no matter how. How quiet we try to be, uh, it's making too much sound. I don't think we have a chance. So we are a bit unlucky with the weather today. The weather definitely makes it more difficult um, to spot the, uh, the wild boars, especially if you look over uh, a field. Hi, Danny. I'm ready. Did you see anything? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What? 600 mice. <laughs> yeah, true. What the fuck was that? What was that? What was that? Damn. And then after 15 minutes, I'm like, nice. Nice. Okay. <laughs> what the jazz is up with this Copenhagen dude, Mr. Klaus? So our gracious host Klaus has of course taken the best spot for himself and he has shot a wild boar. Did you have a lot of boars in the recording? Yes. Oh, seven, excellent. eight, ten, perhaps. Nice. So, and they were, yeah, all over. Yeah, he surely had boars all over the place. They light up very, very differently than mice on the thermals. So I completely understand his enthusiasm. Yeah, the ground. I can see something right over there. Meta puts the thermal to good use and spots a warm rock. Shit, it was a mouse. A rat? A big one. No, I guess a rat. Apparently the size of a wild boar, though. I cannot see any blood. Nope. Should we just try to go back here, wave? Uh, and try Should, to see yeah, the just one... try and find the, yeah, the, the blood. place of impact and, uh, and see if there's... There's got to be some blood somewhere. Yeah. Klaus is positive he made a good shot, but we are not finding any signs of a hit. Have you seen anything? 
thing at all. No, no. no. not really. Uh, <sighs> it's good. Yeah. Let's go back and take a look. Yeah, yeah let's yeah. take a look at, at the video and then... One thing about these new tick scopes are their ability to actually record the shot and the impact. What we're going to do is heading back to the cabin and have a look on the video that he has recorded. Yeah, here it is. Okay, yes. Yeah, that up with light. Well, oh, yeah. Take a look. Yeah, yeah, it's a uh, yeah. no, it's just rolling. rolling. In the, yeah. If you look at the big tree, you can see it was on the left side on the big tree. I looked on the left side yeah, also, yeah, but yeah. Um, I think it look no, it's okay. I think it looks like it's um, yeah, that it's been hit. We now know that we have a hit and that we were looking in the wrong area. Yeah, it's that one. This looks more like. Right. Yeah. This looks like. Right. Do we see something right there? It must be an animal. I'm sure that it was over here. Yeah. Ow! That's blood. It look like lungs, actually. Yeah, like lungs. Lungs. yeah, yeah. And it don't smell like stomach. Oh, it's it's so it's a lift on the stone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And here. Yeah, yeah. Here. There's a lot of blood. Yeah. Okay, let's start. It's it's over there, yeah. right? I can see something that's lighting up this way. I can see it. Oh, yeah. 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 I think 120 kilos at least. Yeah. Oh, that then, is that's the, the That's the inset. That's uh, oh, where okay, I actually yeah. shot it. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God, it's a big one. Jesus. I think 120 kilos. <laughs> Come on, man. Come on. <laughs> because this is just <laughs> not fun. <laughs> oh. Oh, I did it, that man. Oh. Why shoot the biggest one on the field? Why not go for like the medium size that we can actually handle? <laughs> They're very fascinating. Oh, majestic animal. Majestic and heavy.
Although it can sometimes feel like a real chore to butcher your own harvest, I think it enhances the appreciation of the animal and the life taken. Maybe we can make something with the wild boar we shot yesterday. Or it's not going to be that wild boar, because when you shoot a wild boar, it's recommended that you test it for trichinella. Yeah. At the supermarket, we bump into the local gang that proudly shows us their home-built Volvo pickup. Super good, guys. That's badass. <laughs> Bye, guys. Oh, goodbye. Quite possibly the coolest, sweetest car in the world. And it surely has an impressive street cred in these woods. We go for this one. Extra salt, normal salt. Let's go home and cook go. some good wild food. And cook? Cook. Are you, are you, are you Swedish? I think we should have a wild boar tenderloin. I think it's one of the best cuts of the animal. But the tenderloin is very good and it doesn't take long time to cook with some chanterelles and some cream, maybe with some thyme. Salt and so. pepper, right? Salt and pepper, yeah. So. It's one of the things we need to pay attention to is that the grill that we're actually using has not been seasoned. If this meat is going to hit the grill as it is right now, it's going to stick right to it. So we want to season the meat a little, a little bit before because we haven't seasoned the grill. Yeah. So we can just simply use a little olive oil and allow us to separate it afterwards. Good idea. Some press time. A little cream? Yep. Yeah. What we want to do is that we want to add the cream gradually. You want to be sure that this is tempered. Okay. So if you add it really cold, it will separate. Okay. We don't want that. <laughs> I would love that. I think we should put on the meat now because yeah. it, it takes more or less 10 minutes to cook that one, right? With resting also. Yep. Yeah, no, no, with the resting is 20 minutes. A good rule of thumb is to let the meat rest around 80% of the time that you cooked it, so in this case, around eight minutes. So we need to, we need to season the meat on the other side, so. That's good. Little olive oil. Pouring the oil on like this is not recommended. Use a brush or use your fingers, otherwise you'll get this. Flames. I have more um, emotions uh, when I cook it. It's mm -hmm. like I appreciate it and admire it much more than if we just bought this one somewhere. Yeah. I think that's one of the biggest challenges with the people in the gravitating towards the city and the urban environment. So I don't have that emotional investment into yeah. what they're eating. And therefore they don't really care. They don't really have any specific emotional connection to it. I got a ladder this morning. Yeah, I put, I put, my poor here? You said stop. <laughs> stop, 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 stop. Cheers. I got a ladder this morning. What do you know? It's perfect. <laughs> it's perfect. Wow. Look at that. That is nice. Good job. Thank you. It's 
Edible or no? Mm. Mm. It's really good. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, mm. Ah, no, it's just your. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 Yeah
This is the Seguccio de Lapanino, that's specifically bred to hunt hair. This little girl, it's the same species, but he trained it specifically for rodeo, so obviously you don't take one out for that, that strain for hair and one for rodeo. This is the uh, the Apanini tank. Where we are right now today is a hunting reserve. These landowners have gone together with Enrico forming it. These uh, the chestnuts are the favorite food for the wild boar. And this entire area of the chestnuts has now started to fall. If you see some of these trees are three, four hundred years old. Here will be torn, turned and torn up to pieces by the wild boar. We're reaching the prime hare habitat just around the tree line where there's lots of feed and cover. This is Marco, who is Pierluigi, who prefers to be called Marco. Vento, brutta macchinata. See? He's saying that uh, there's quite a lot of wind, so it's not the best for the dogs to, to cast the spray on. I could die in this moment and feel that I had lived a life well. But hey, there's a hare out there that needs some cooking, so off we go. saying that they're on a trail where you can hear it in the intensity of their barks. It's a, it's a hare that's been moving around, so they're finding the trail now, but when we start hearing them getting more intense, we have to fo follow them along and try, and try and move forward and get up in front of the, the hare. A well-trained dog gets on the track of a hare and then pushes it back towards the hunters. Surely not an easy task. Alessio is probably sleeping last night off. Now nah, he's awake. So the wild card, uh, Mr. Igor, uh, one, of the, one of the dogs is not, uh, he's a little on the edge sometimes and he uh, likes to roam around and he gets on the track of, of roe deer or fallow deer and he takes off. So he took off.
The dogs are barking intensely nearby. Now we have to listen to their direction and try to get in front of them. Beautiful here. Dinner. Our lunch rather secured. Much. That's good. Meal. It's wonderful to see the cattle roaming free in nature, in sharp contrast to the factory farming methods. In this little hamlet on top of Italy, this still exists, and the younger generations are actually embracing the lifestyle. The appreciation of the harvested animal is for me always amplified when dressing and cleaning it. There's always an intimacy that fosters an increased gratitude for the life taken. It says that it's old. Go. He's leaving the head on there, but uh, typically they don't, I mean, there's no meat on it, but you can use it for broth. So I'm um, cooking broth on it. So he's, uh, he's cutting it up, so into small pieces, and then I'm assuming it will go into the, uh, now Maria takes over and I'm all ears. Nothing like harvesting your own meat and veggies in your backyard. Celery? Celona? Carotas. Carrots, celery, and Parsley, a little rosemary. (laughs) 
It is a dream come true for me, cooking alongside an Italian nonna and sharing it with all of you. So the pork fat really here it helps keep the moisture inside the, the hair, otherwise it will, will cook and it can easily get very dry. when you put it in, you use really high heat and then you turn it down. What we are looking for here is the caramelization on the outside that will actually seal off the meat and keep the moisture inside. It's important you turn it around and turn it a lot in the pot so the ingredients, the onions, mix really well. So now it stays here for a couple of hours. When it's cooked, I asked for how long. She was like, hmm. So that's a kind of one on the, on the feeling, I think. I have always enjoyed, appreciated, and respected the elderly generation, something that is inherent in most Italian homes, where generations often share the same living quarters. The cows that we met earlier have granted Elisa a couple of buckets of milk, and now it's time to turn that into cheese. Devo scaldarlo e poi mettere il caglio. Prend it. Okay, okay. Nonna Maria has passed down much of her knowledge to her children and grandchildren, keeping the family tradition of cheese making very much alive and thriving. Right now it's it's mixed, but once you cut it, it allows the the, the whey and the the milk and the, the fat to actually separate. And then you use one part for ricotta and then the other part for cheese. So depending, depending on what cheese you're actually making it for, so if you make it for soft cheese, then you cut it into big pieces. If you make it for hard cheese, you cut it in much smaller pieces the size of rice grain. And these are the size of uh, nuts. and then a little bit of water, a little bit of salt, and then it gets covered up and then cooked. Amore di pazienza. Some wine and Alessio's homemade wild boar salami. Life is good. This is the result of Maria and Elisa's labor of love. The hardworking camera crew and additional family members all join in for perfect feast. Then it's back home for a little nap before we all meet up again for festive lunch. Rested and excited to gather around the family table with everyone, I skip along. Pretty excited to see how the, uh, how the hair actually came out. It's been cooking now for what? Three hours, three and a half hours? Ciao, gracias, Vanessa. 
Oh, no. A bit of perfume, I <laughs> Laundry also needs doing. I get it. No. Adesso deve che pronta. Un bottiglia di vino per te. Grazie. E una, una produzione di vicino mia casa. Somewhere just around now, I'm realizing that there will be no family lunch. Enrico's sister Lucia is laughing. <laughs> Living off and with the land requires you to synchronize your lifestyle accordingly, to adapt to the rhythm of life and seasons. <laughs> So when you're still in New York City mode and mindset, well then you get sent on your way to eat a delicious wild hair lunch out of a plastic container alone. Well, not alone. Solitude in nature is for me the ultimate luxury. One that most no longer can afford and don't see the value in. This might seem like a dream to most. I often feel so myself. To quote John Muir, of all the paths you take in life, make sure a few of them are dirt. Got each night.